All right, my name is uh, Bradley Yergin, and I'm going to give the talk today. And so I want to um, qualify first that um, I am a Dharma student of uh, Lama Jempas, and part of uh, being a student is that he um, he allows us to give these talks, you know, and it's really um, can be transformative, and it also can be really stressful and difficult because you have to you get a topic and you have to work with the topic, and. Uh, and it's, um, you know, I, I, I would say with this topic that I chose, and so I chose this practice called Gendan Langyama, and the English title is 100 Deities of Tushita. And it's basically a prayer to Lama Sankapa. It's this reverential prayer. And I, after I chose the topic, I kind of started to think about, like, you know, Lama's giving commentaries, and I was just like, oh, my God, this is, like, way over my head, you know? So how am I going to give this talk about this practice that I find really profound and so um, typically what we do is we meet with Lama Jimpa and we, um, we kind of sort through our, the issues that we have and we try to come to terms with like how we're going to present the topic. And so um, with me I, and with my discussions with him, we talked about kind of what is your experience and what is it that you know about this topic, you know, and how, and, and also he gave me some little tidbits of his experience, but not too much because it's kind of like you have to develop it on your own. But and again, I like to uh, I like what Matthew said. This is my book report, so that that kind of that kind of puts it in a parameter. It's not like you know I'm giving some big teaching, but I'm giving I'm, I'm reporting to you about what I found. So um, you know, I, I in in the vein of you know Lama Sankapa was this huge figure in Tibet, you know, and he um, he you know, is, uh, is, you know, we here, we practice all four lineages of Buddhism, which, which all four lineages of Tibetan Buddhism. So the Nyingma, Kagyu, Sakya, and the Galupa lineage, or the Galug lineage. And so Lama Tsongkhapa comes from the Galug lineage, but at the same time, he, um, he was a great reformer, and, and there was no Galug lineage at the time of, of, that he'd lived. So he pulled together all these different um, teachings from all the different lineages, and he, um, and he formed a new lineage called the Galuga lineage. So, um, you know, with with um, with thinking about Lama Tsongkhapa, I had to really think about like the Lamrim first. You know, the Lamrim is his huge text that he wrote. That literally, we like to say, it encompasses all of Buddhism in in the Lamrim. And so, you know, I, I was thinking about how. Um, you know, we're super fortunate that we have a temple here. You know, and we, I walk in the door particularly every week and I kind of take it for granted and I sit down and, and I, I, um, I get a lot of benefit from the temple itself. But this is a really extraordinarily rare thing. You know, you can't, you know, you don't, you can't just walk into temples everywhere. The other thing that's really, really unique too is that we have all these people here that are, that are sincerely trying to practice. And, and that's an unusual thing too, you know, it's, um, it, you know, the Dharma, do, it doesn't exist everywhere, you know, and people from other countries and other places, you know, will we'll tell you that. And so the other thing that we have that's really fortunate is that we have a teacher, you know, that not only do we have a temple where there's this peaceful environment, but we have a teacher that can, um, you know, teach us about all these different aspects of the Dharma, you know, and, our, and, uh, and has experience with all these different aspects. So, um, you know, we don't know how long this opportunity is going to last, you know, and I, um, you know, speaking from experience, you know, I, I first, you know, found Buddhism in the Bay Area, and then I moved to Seattle, and there was like, this great community up there. And then I came here to, um, to Sacramento, and I like, I didn't have anybody to practice with, you know, and I spent many several years just practicing on my own and going to teachings of teachers and, and, uh, and I found Lama Jimpa kind of early on, but I, I didn't really, um, I didn't really understand what was going on, and I didn't really, you know, groove with the the group at the time. But I, um, one of my teachers was a was a monk from um, Gandan Monastery, and he, you know, they would have these groups of monks that would come, you know, and we would, uh, and I helped sponsor a couple of years of those monks coming to Sacramento, and uh, with one of those tours. Um, we ended up over at um, Lions Roar, you know, and it was 2003, and it was in the, over off of Watt Avenue. 
And, uh, and Lama Jimpa requested um, Gendam Mungama, like an oral transmission from the um, teacher at the time. And his name was Geshe Lungtuk. And it was, uh, it was Sering's uncle, Sering the translator, it was his uncle. And, uh, and I remember, you know, my life was kind of a little bit chaotic at the time, but I remember thinking, oh, I know this practice. And this, it was a very familiar thing. And, and, uh, and I, I think that my, my um, relationship with Lama Jimpa kind of started around that time. You know, it was several years later that I ended up coming here, but, but um, that was kind of my early experiences with it. And so I think that um, we can't um, really talk about this practice unless we talk about Lama Sankapa, you know, in his life a little bit, you know, and, uh, and it's kind of hard for a lot of people to see, but he's the, or actually the, the front image is him on the right hand side and the field of merit is this image that's kind of on this side over here. And so, um, you know, Lama Sankapa was born in uh, 1357 in a province called Amdo in, um, in um, Tibet. And so it's, you know, one of the things that I didn't really realize when, until I started researching this was that his, uh, his mother was Tibetan, but his father was Mongolian. And he, um, there were many um, different um, prophecies that he was coming. And one of them was, you know, Buddha Shakyamuni um, prophesied that Sankhapa's birth and attainments would be great. And he would be born as a um, boy um, by the name of Lo Sangdrapa. And the, and the Indian term for Lo Sangdrapa is, uh, let me see here, Sumatikirti, and which the translation is, uh, uh, what's, there's an there's a Lo Sangdrapa, anyway, so, so Buddha Shakyamuni um, prophesied that um, that he would be born in Tibet and that he would be a, um, a great teacher and spread the Dharma to all over Tibet. And then also Guru Rinpoche also prophesied that um, that he would be born. And uh, and he um, his prophecy was that he would um, he would uh, create this statue that would be a um, really well known statue that everybody would revere. Um, so, you know, right off after he was born, um, he had a lot of a lot of unusual things happened. You know, he could read really quickly. He um, he was able to memorize text really quickly. Um, his teacher um, Choje Dondurup Rinchen um, had dreams that he was going to be born in a certain place, and he found him really early on and was able to um, help him develop into um, you know a scholar and be able to. Um, provide him with the education that that he felt was necessary and so um you know lama sankapa um you know became a monk studied and at a really early age he started giving teachings at like 19 or 20 which is a pretty unusual thing and he um you know people recognized right away that he that he was pretty unusual and that he wasn't just an ordinary um you know monk um, he went off and did um, several really long retreats, you know, in his 20s and 30s. And uh, one of his retreats, he did a retreat on Manjushri. And uh, during the retreat, he, um, he had a vision of Manjushri and he was able to communicate with Manjushri. And so um, one of the unique things about him was is that, that throughout um, the rest of his life, you know, he would do these long retreats, he would have lots of questions, and the whole concept was is that he was communicating directly with Manjushri and, and clearing up topics that he had that um, that he couldn't quite resolve. And so um, it was pretty interesting too when some of the um, the text that I was reading was they did this he went away on retreat with several of his disciples and they did this uh, this crazy long retreat and they they um, they did like over a million prostrations and they did um, you know, extensive Vajrasafa, and they did all of these really extensive practices that probably nowadays, I don't, I don't think anybody really could be able to match, but I think what Lama Sankapa did was he kind of, uh, he was a, he was a, um, he was able to demonstrate, like, here's how you practice, you know, you, you kind of spend this time accumulating knowledge, you study, and then from that, you go into retreat, and then from that, you try to gain kind of experiential, um, you know, understanding of what's going on. And from that, you try to 
go out and, and uh, you know, teach to other people and benefit other people. And so, um, you know, Lama Sankapa had a teacher named Rindawa who was um, a Sakya master. And he, um, he really revered his teacher, Rindawa. And he, um, he created this prayer that he offered to his teacher. And, um, and his teacher um, took the prayer and changed his own name back to Sankapa's name. And that's where the Migsema prayer comes from. And so it's really, it's really beautiful, you know what I mean? It's, it's um, you know, it's almost like it's like Sankapa's gratitude and heart, you know, is reaching out to his teacher. And his teacher is saying like, no, you know, this is for you because this is what I see in you. And I talked to, um, I talked to Lama Jempa a little bit about the, um, the Migsema prayer. And he, um, he was saying, you know, that, um, that Sankapa had all those elements in him. You know, he had the, um, the wisdom of Manjushri. You know, he had the compassion of Avalokiteshvara. You know, he had the power of Vajrapani. And, uh, and, and Lama was saying that he thought like if, if uh, Sankapa was alive today, he would be this like incredibly kind scholar. You know, and he goes, you don't always find those two things together, you know, because a lot of times when people are scholars, they have this real kind of thing about being super knowledgeable. But he was saying that he thought that Sankapa would have been um, really kind, really knowledgeable, but very super powerful, you know, able to convey his point and, and able to help people, um, you know, transform. And so also when we were talking about um, this, this practice, Gyanda Langyama, um, Lama was telling me the story about when he, um, he had, had several teachers, you know, and his, his teacher, Geshe Ondra, or Losen Gyatso, as he's known, um, when he first met him, this was the practice that he gave him. He said, here, this is what I want you to do. And I was, I thought that was pretty amazing because there, there are a whole bunch of different practices, you know, that he could have offered him. But this, you know, this practice of, um, Yendamun Gyama, which is, is a guru yoga type of practice. And, and I'll explain that in a minute. You know, it was, uh, yeah, I thought, I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting and unusual. And so, um, you know, what is guru yoga? You know, there are, there are lots of, there are several different texts that we call guru yoga. And the, the, the cool thing about this text is, is that you don't have to have any initiations or any empowerments in it. Um, and it's a way, Guru Yoga is a way to, um, you know, receive blessings, number one, from, from your teacher. And also it's a way for you to kind of like open up your heart and open up yourself to be able to merge a little bit with your teacher. And I have a quote here um, that comes from uh, Alexander Berzin. And the, the um, Guru Yoga is defined as a practice done with visualizations with which one image that so sorry, with, with which one imagines that one's own qualities of body, speech, and mind become joined with the qualities of one's own spiritual teacher. And so it's funny too how I was thinking about how like, you know, as a, as a Buddhist practitioner, you know, in the Tibet, Tibetan tradition particularly, we're always trying to view our teacher as like, a, as like Buddha. We're trying to... Um, connect with our teacher who has these qualities that are like most like Buddha that we know, you know, and I, and I was thinking about it and I was like, man, I was like, it's kind of funny because he already sees Buddha in all of us, you know, he already sees that quality in us and we're trying to see it in him, you know, and, uh, and that's really what this practice is about. It's about, you know, receiving blessings from, um, not only, um, our teacher, but from the lineage, you know, and the, um, the thing is too, is that it's, it, um, you know, one person only has a certain amount of power, but the fact that, you know, our teacher, um, is part of this huge lineage that stretches back thousands of years, you know, and that we, um, you know, really what we're doing is we're connecting with that. We're not just connecting with the teacher and their kind of, um, pure kind of mind. Right. So and I, another thing that Lama Jimpa said about this practice, too, I, when I was asking him about it, and he was talking about connecting to the lineage and the, and the teachings, 
he was telling me that like a whole bunch of people did a whole bunch of work for us to be sitting here experiencing what we're experiencing. You know, when you look at the, um, the, the, you know, there's a picture with all the lineage in Lama Sankapa up there. And it, um, and those are really all the people that are like kind of well-known famous people that are in those images, you know, but when you think about just the, on a, like a smaller level, you know, all the work that it takes to keep this temple going, you know, and all the work that it took to keep the monasteries going and all the work from generation to generation that people passed down, you know, so that we could be the benefactors, you know, is really pretty amazing. And so we're also trying to connect with that too. And so, um, let me get my notes here. So my idea today too was to be able to um, to recite this prayer and be able to get have some experience of it. And uh, and I have that up on the monitor in a minute here. The other thing too is that I was thinking about this too was that you know we come to a temple and uh, and there's so many different practices you know and uh, and Susan kind of touched on this with the medicine Buddha practice she she um, you know talked about the medicine Buddha practice we have all these different deity practices that we do and uh, and we have our own practice that we do every day and it can be really like overwhelming it's like well what am I supposed to be doing you know look at all these things that that um that i have and i and i i definitely have um felt like that at times but i think the way we have to look at this and, and susan had pointed this out also is that we have all these different tools you know and uh and we have medicine buddha to help with healing you know when it comes to um people that are around us that are suffering and uh and and i think you know the this practice of guru yoga or uh gendan Langama, I think is a tool that helps us um, develop merit and merit's kind of like this positive energy, you know, and, uh, um, and it's really like positive energy around being able to, um, to like build our practice, strengthen our relationship with our teacher. Um, like it helps us also like there's, there's a lot of obstacles. Like when you're trying to practice, there are a lot of things that come up. And I got to say, a lot of mine are like mental obstacles. You know, I, I mean, I like sometimes come in and I'm just like, oh, you know, how am I, you know, all that, all the mental obstacles. And so I, um, I had a sheet here about the benefits. What are the benefits of actually doing this practice? And so um, I have so many pieces of paper. <laughs> so the benefits, and I can't even find it, but I kind of have remembered it a little bit. Oh yeah, here it is, right here. So the benefits of doing Gendan Langama is you'll overcome obstacles to the practice and the obstacles are inner, outer, and the inner obstacles are, um, are our delusions that we have. And that's kind of what I was speaking to earlier. You know, the outer obstacles are um, living beings. And I think even like the outer obstacles are like, you know, you're practicing, you feel like you're making progress and then like somebody at home gets sick or you have to take your kids to some other event or work is demanding you to stay late all the time where you didn't, you know, and so there are all these different obstacles. And this is, this is kind of like this energy to like clear away that stuff so that you can, you can be able to practice. And uh, also what it does too, and I, and I definitely have this is it purifies your degenerate Samaya vows. And so we, um, you know, we take all these kind of elaborate, vows in buddhism and it's and it's really to kind of help us keep us on course but um over the period of time being just kind of like an ordinary being those things get a little bit dinged up those vows and so what this does is it helps us kind of like um purify some of those vows you know and uh it also um this is the one i like too it also helps us to um it, pur it purifies things so that we can come to practice Dharma effortlessly, you know? So um, anyway, those are the, those are the um, benefits of the practice. And so, you know, one of the things I was thinking about too, is we, um, you know, we, we have all these different practices that we do, but a lot of them have like a similar theme to them. And uh, in Gendam Mangyama definitely has a similar theme. And uh, one of the, the theme that, is in the prayer is called the seven limb prayer and we do this before all of all the teachings we just did the seven limb prayer in the, um, 
the prayers that we recited. And, uh, and the way that this practice came about was um, Sankapa student, after he had passed away, um, was doing the seven limb practice and he had a vision of, of Sankapa. And he, um, and so as a result of that, he, um, he created this, these prayers so that, um, that other people could have this connection and experience also. So with that, um, so we're going to um, do the, the recitation and we have it up on Zoom up here. There's uh, this, um, this translation comes from Lama Zopa and there's a couple of sections that are in here that, um, that, are, um, that he added that kind of make it into a really longer practice. And so we're going to skip those sections and I'll just go through, you know, at that point. And so also, um, you know, before I forget, um, you know, my sources for this talk, um, there aren't a lot of books on this practice, but there's, there are a lot of commentaries. And so usually a teacher will, um, will give the oral transmission and they'll give a commentary about the practice. And so the commentaries that I um, used were um, Lama Zopa's, obviously, the commentary on Gen Lung Gamma. I also used Lochin Rinpoche's commentary, How to Practice Gen Lung Gamma. And they also went on to um, um, Dr. Uh, Alexander Burson has a um, has a website and it has like every single topic in Tibetan Buddhism that you could think of. And not only does it have every topic, but it also has like um, it has all the sadhanas. It has um, it has like you could type in so, like a, a person's name, like a Tibetan's name, and it'll it'll give you their biography. I mean, it's a pretty amazing. Um, website. So his name is Alexander Burson. All right. So at this point, um, we're going to um, recite the prayers here. And uh, all right. Can everybody see it up on the screen? There we go. All right. So we're going to start with the preliminaries. And so I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by the merits of generosity and so forth, may I become Buddha to benefit transmigrated beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits of generosity and so forth, may I become Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit of generosity and so forth, May I become Buddha in order to benefit transmigratory beings. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were able to abide in equanimity, free from the closeness of attachment and the distance of hatred. May they abide in equanimity. I myself will cause them to abide in equanimity. Oh, it takes a little while to get forward. Please, Guru Deity, bless me to be able to do this. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were able to achieve Buddhahood. May they achieve Buddhahood. May I myself cause them to achieve Buddhahood. Please, Guru Deity, bless me to be able to do this. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be free from suffering and its causes. I myself will cause them to be free from suffering and its causes. Please, Guru Deity, bless me to be able to do this. So we're going to skip forward here a little bit. From the heart of the Savior of the hundred deities of Tushita, on the peak of a cloud resembling a clump of extremely fresh curd, King of the Dharma, omniscient Losang Drapa, please come here together with your sons. In the sky before me on a lion throne, lotus and moon, my perfect guru smiles with delight. Supreme field of merit of my mind of faith, please abide for a hundred eons to spread the teachings. Your holy mind has the intelligence that understands the full extent of objects to be known. Your holy speech with its excellent explanations is the ear ornament of those of good fortune. Your holy body is radiant, beautiful with glory renowned. To you who are meaningful to see, hear, and remember, I prostrate. 
Pleasing drinking water, various flowers, fragrant incense, light scented waters, and so forth. Ocean of clouds like offerings, both actually arranged and mentally imagined. I offer to you with the supreme field of merit. Whatever non-virtues of body, speech, and mind, especially those opposed to the three vows, I rejoice the collecting from the beginning of this time. I confess each and every one with fervent regret from my heart. You strove for much learning and practice in this degenerate age, and you made freedoms and riches meaningful. By abandoning the eight worldly concerns, Savior, we sincerely rejoice in your extensive deeds. Perfect, pure, holy gurus from bellowing clouds of wisdom and compassion in the sky of the Dharmakaya, please let fall a rain of profound and extensive dharma upon the receptacle of those to be subdued exactly as they need. May whatever virtues I have collected benefit the teachings and all the transmigratory beings, and in particular, may it cause the essence of the perfect, pure, Lissandrapa's teachings to shine forever. This crowned and anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all my great beings enjoy this pure land. All right, so by the force of having fervently requested in this way, hollow beams of the white light are emitted from the hearts of the perfect for Father and Son, and combining into it with the crown. White nectar of the color of flows the most of the ground can be white, cleansing all my sickness and harms, negativity, karmas, obstructions, and imprints without exception. My body becomes as pure and clear as a crystal. All right, we're going to recite this in English. Vajradhara, Lord of the sages of the sources of all realizations, Avalokiteshvara, a great treasure of non objectifying compassion, Manjushri, master of stainless wisdom, Lord of secrets, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Losang Drapa, crown ornament of the sages of the lands of the snow. To you, Guru Buddha, embodying the three refuges, I make requests bestowing yours. Please bless me and others to be ripened and liberated. Please bestow the supreme and the common realizations. Please bless me to quickly become like you. All right, so we're going to skip past the seven wisdoms. All right, requests. May my wisdom of listening, reflecting, and meditating increase. May my wisdom of explaining, debating, composing develop. May I be granted the supreme and common realizations. Please bless me to quickly become like you. May my transcendental wisdom of spontaneously born great bliss arise. May my stains of mistaken grasping things as real be purified. May my net of doubts that are only mine be cut off. Please bless me quickly to become like you. The foundation of all good qualities. The foundation of all good quality is the kind and perfect guru. Correct devotion to him is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon him with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is great and meaningful and is dope to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly day and night takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the result of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definitive intuition in this, please bless me always to be careful and abandon even the slightest negative actions and accomplish all the deeds deeds. Seeking samsara's pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, 
mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. We of the teachings is keeping the Pradimoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all my mother transforming beings. Please bless me to see this train in the Supreme Bodhicitta and bear the responsibility of freeing transmigrating beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With the clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva's vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly with my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At the time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping the pure vows in Samaya. As I have become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges with my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy and never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that of the Guru Shusha Noble Path, and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives, and bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances, in all my lives, never separate from the perfect gurus. May I enjoy the magnificent dharma by compelling the qualities of the stages of the path. May I attain the name, the state of the Vajradhara. All right, so we're going to recite the request at the heart, or to abide in the heart. Magnificent and precious root guru, please abide on the lotus and see at my heart. Guide me with your great kindness and grant me the realizations of your holy body speech in mind. Magnificent and precious Guru, please abide on the lotus and seat at my heart. Guide me with your great kindness and grant me the supreme and common realizations. Magnificent and precious Root Guru, please abide on the lotus and seat at my heart. Guide me with your great kindness and remain steadfast until I attain the essence of enlightenment. All right, and then we'll just do the dedication here. So by the force of the victorious one Sankapa, acting as our direct Mahayana virtuous friend in all our lives, may we never turn away for even a second, for the pure path highly admired by the victorious one. May we be able to live a life of pure morality, listening to many teachings, train in bodhicitta, and have correct view of conduct without corrupting or polluting the teachings of Louis Sankrapa, the second victorious one. Glorious Guru, whatever your body, retinue, lifespan, and realm, whatever your supreme and excellent name, may I and others become exactly like that. By the force of the praise and requests made to you, may all diseases, evil spirits, poverty, quarrel be calmed, and may the Dharma and good fortune increase in the regions in which I and others dwell. Please bless me in the lives of the glorious ones live long, and that being, being, knowing the extent of space, be happy. That I and others, without exception, collect merit and purify obscurations, and that we quickly achieve Buddhahood. May I not be given rise to heresy for even a second in regard to the actions of the glorious gurus. May I see whatever actions are done as pure with the devotion with the Dharma King Sankapa, way of the Dharma to flourish, may I and all signs of obstacles be pacified and all conducive conditions be complete. Due to the two types of merits of the three times of myself and others, yeah, teachings of the victorious one, those Sankrapa shine for, forever. All right, well, that's kind of... <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's kind of the short version of the prayer too. That I was trying to um, dial it in a little bit so that it wouldn't be quite nearly as long. Let me get this on a little bit better. So the whole the whole point of this uh, 
of this practice. Let's see. So the whole point of the prayer is is not to um, yeah, the whole point of the prayer is you know as we're reciting the prayer we're actually visualizing and we are um, we're trying to get our minds in a certain kind of place and it's um, when you're doing it as a group it's a little bit difficult and it's also a little bit difficult if you haven't like had instructions like commentary is what I was talking about before. And so with all of these prayers that we recite, you know, where there's a there's a mind that you're trying to generate along with the prayers, you know, and so we need to kind of keep that in mind. And uh, and so with any um, with any text, it takes time to like work on it and work with it. And that's the whole idea of, of all of these practices that we have, you know, it, um, you know, usually um, you know, when you're given a, a, a text to work with, you're given a commitment. And the reason that you're given a commitment is, is that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to waver with things, but when you have some commitment, you're kind of like, well, this is what I, I've decided that like, this is a beneficial practice and this is what I want to do. And so now I'm going to work with it. And so at that point, or at this point, um, you know, I've, uh, yeah, I presented Lama Sankapa's life, um, you know, the benefits of the teachings, um, you know, you know, the, the way that I found benefit in it. And then even like Lama, or, uh, Lama Jimpa's advice. Um, I think, yeah, I think at this point, like I'm, I'm ready if anybody has any questions or I don't know if I'm ready, but I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my bad. I forgot one thing. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. Um, I know you said a little bit just a moment ago about um, there's a certain state of mind or um, type of mind that we're trying to cultivate when we're doing the practice. Can you right. talk a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, I can. So um, I'll use like I'll use our um, prayer book as an example. So, you know, we um, we, you know, we recite the prayers before we do the actual um, teachings, you know, and so, you know, the first um, praises that we do to Buddhist Shakyamuni, you know, we're um, we're trying to like we're trying to be in a mind state of where we're actually thinking of like, oh, this is a very special being, and and uh, we um, we we hit a point where we do offerings and we recite this prayer about the offerings, and so in our minds we're mentally thinking, oh, I'm offering things that are like pure things that that um, you know, water offerings, flowers, incense. And so at each of these little junctures, we're not just reciting a bunch of words, we're thinking and we're, we're trying to like from our heart, we're trying to like, you know, think about these things and have like this kind of close experience with, with uh, you know, the prayer and with the teachers and with the beings, you know, we believe that these beings, these enlightened beings exist, you know, and that it's not, you know, it's not, they're not just pictures and, and they're representational of, of, um, of deities that exist. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's really what we're, when I, when I am saying we're trying to get in these mindsets, we're, we're going through these each individually with these prayers. And I, and I think for me, at least, it's much easier to do this individually because you can kind of pace yourself and you can go at your own pace and you can really kind of get into the, the rhythm of it, you know. And, uh, and we come here because we're, we're kind of like, we come to the temple and we practice and we, we learn, and then we take that home, and then we, we incorporate it into our own individual practice. Yeah. Thank you. You got it. Thanks, Brad. You got it. Uh, I'm curious. Um, do you ever notice it becoming rote, where it's just sort of you're reading it and 
you know, like you have this long-standing commitment to it. Do you, you know, do you ever notice it where it's just, you're just kind of going through the motion, not necessarily even all that engaged with it? And if so, what do you do to sort of train yourself away from that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, I think that's a pitfall, but I think it's also like a normal part of doing practice because, you know, just like in our everyday lives, we, you, you, we, we have, or at least, I don't know about you, but I have these, I go into autopilot, you know, you know, with my family, with my job and, and it, um, it sometimes loses meaning, you know, and like, and then even, even it, it can be a little frustrating too. You're like, what am I doing? You know, but you, I think it, it takes effort to refocus and, and it also takes motivation and, and I get motivation from coming to Dharma talks, you know, reading texts and commentaries. Um, you know, there's so many YouTube videos out these days of teachers giving talks. And so I think a way for it to not be so rote like that, it's to try to find inspiration, you know, and then also I think to, to not give yourself a hard time because that's kind of the normal ebb and flow of at least my life. I don't, I don't know about everybody else has been. So yeah, so trying to find inspiration, that would be the answer. Thank you for your talk. Yeah. It was wonderful. And they're new to me, so it was quite beautiful. And it, stri it strikes me that um, so much of what we do is um, like these visualizations. Um, it's like you come to it with so much love. It's like a, it's, it's like you're, you're like a lover, you know, mm. you're like offering flowers yeah. and perfume and it's this sense of devotion yeah. that, um, that has to be, that has to be there. You know, it's this sort of, you're entreating them as the guru, the gurus, mm. but then also my understanding is that they kind of have to answer. <laughs> yeah. There's a two way street. It's it a two way street. huh? And so, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you have received, the blessings you've received. Yeah, I think, um, I haven't had any Buddhists talking to me yet, but I think that the feeling that I get from the blessings are, um, I feel inspired. I think that's where it comes from. It's inspiration, you know, and, uh, and it also, you know, I mean, I think, uh, I don't know the, the, a lot of times I, I chase like my mood around a lot, like, oh, I want to feel good or I want to feel this or I want to feel that. And it's really kind of a hollow thing to chase around, you know, like wanting to feel like good all the time or inspired. But I think the thing that I feel though is like I, I could feel really um, kind of dejected and, and not very inspired, but I do these practices and I feel inspired and I feel uplifted and I feel like I want to, um, you know, I want to be a better person, better Dharma practitioner. And I think that that's the, that's the level of communication that I have, you know? So thanks. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. <clears throat> I find that last week, uh, Lama spoke about realms. Mm. And uh, I find that I struggle, and I'm just wondering how you manage this, because you did kind of touch on it. I struggle in the realm of work, that <laughs> uh -huh. I feel that uh, there's expectations that would go against Dharma practices. Uh -huh. So how do you reconcile that? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I mean, I think that, um... You know, the whole world that we live in is kind of sometimes opposite to what we're trying to do. And I think that, um, I think we have to find like little, little things that we can find wins, you know, or, or little things that we can, we can do to, um, to feel like we're, 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 we're being able to practice, you know, and I think that those little things can be extended like little by little, you know, I, uh, you know, I work in a hospital and, and there's just so many pressures, you know, and even after all the COVID stuff, there's still like all these pressures and it, um, it's really like easy to feel like frustrated and, and, and frankly pissed off, <laughs> you know, but I think that, um, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do to try to like, look at things from different angles, you know, 
And, and I think regardless of what's going on, we can be compassionate to people, right? We can be compassionate to the people at work that we think don't really get how we're supposed to do our job and they're telling us something different. You know, we can, uh, we can be compassionate for ourselves, ourselves, you know, I mean, I feel like, I feel like I, you know, you struggle or you fall and then you get back up and, and you keep try to try, you try to keep going. But, um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it seems like the Dharma is big enough to try to look at things from a bunch of different angles and try to find solutions. But I think the problem, the problem that we have is we're in this kind of, you know, realm where we're not, I mean, it's, we're experiencing suffering. We're seeing a whole bunch of suffering around us and, and, it, and it can be really overwhelming, you know? And, and I think it's, you know, my mind tries to make sense of it. You know, it doesn't really make sense, but you know, I, I think again, trying to find, use these different tools that we have to try to transform this experience that seems, you know, like relentless and, and difficult. I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's, the, that's what I got. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Are you guys students in the back? Yeah, so you know, um, you, you probably need a lot of good information to be able to write up what you're going to write up. And so, uh, you know, there's, so that if you type in this person's name, Alexander Burzin, and it's called the Burzin Archives, it's B-E-R-Z-I-N. There's a whole bunch of information on there that you'll be able to like write your uh, your papers and like answer all these questions. Study yeah, study Buddhism exactly. I love that website and it it um yeah this is probably like a little bit lofty but what's on there is really is really good to be able to understand it. Do you guys have any questions at all? We wrote like a few down, um, but one of them was, how do you see the secular and the sacred paths of transformation play out like in your life or daily life? That's really good. That's a really good question. Did somebody give you that question to ask? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what, I'll, I'll um, the way that I do it, I'm, I'm, I'm probably kind of a little bit different. Everybody has a different way of interacting with, with their set, their lives. Like I, I don't, I don't go to work and tell everybody that I'm Buddhist. I mean, some people know that I'm, I practice Buddhism, and I, and I don't like try to hide it. But I think my work environment is a very secular environment, you know, and uh, and I can't go around reciting all these prayers. I mean, I could do stuff mentally, and I do sometimes will recite mantras. But I think from a secular standpoint, you know, Buddhism teaches compassion for people. You know, Buddhism. Um, you know, teaches um, like just respecting people's, you know, who people are and their and their backgrounds and their lives, and and so the secular for me is is being able to, um, you know, meet people like in a dignified way and 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 being respectful, and also the other thing, the great secular thing too, is trying to benefit people, you know. And, and not doing it in the context of like, well, I'm a Buddhist and this is what Buddhists do, you know, but doing it in the context of like just being a human being. And I think that um, secular Buddhism is about kind of like trying to develop people to be like really good people, good human beings, you know? And uh, yeah, and I think, I think also too, people naturally kind of gravitate to that, you know, but sometimes there, there are obstacles to, to trying to like do things to benefit people. All right, so what, what other questions do you have? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We got another hour. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, what is your favorite way to engage in reflection or practice your religion? Oh, what is my favorite way? Well, I think, um, I think, I think the meditation practice, like, to me is, uh, actually, that's difficult, because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different ways to um, answer that question, but I think I'll start with meditation practice. You know, I um, I came to Buddhism because I thought, you know what, I um, meditation I think will really help me. You know, I'm really like I need something to help me be like calm and centered, and and I also thought like I want I want to learn a practice. I don't want to just have some 
you know, made up thing. And I think that, um, you know, having a structured way to learn how to meditate and, and, you know, have a focused mind and, um, and it's, and I, and I guess too, part of it was I wanted to be happy. Like, oh, I want I want to learn how to meditate. So I'll be more happy. But I think the crazy thing about it is, is that meditation is like so much more than that, you know, and really what I've learned in meditation is I've gotten to learn a lot about myself, you know, and to see kind of the particulars about like, how my mind works, how emotions arise, how I interact with other people. And so, um, you know, a simple, I guess a simple answer to that would be, um, you know, the meditation element of it. All right, what other, what? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to read it. <laughs> uh, what about the, there was like a wish fulfilling jewel medicine, something about like, yeah wow that's that's a tough question to answer he somebody gave me these questions ahead of time no i'm just kidding you're no you that's a that's an interesting thing to focus on and so um well i'm not i'm not quite sure i can uh, all right go ahead we yeah we gotta take her <laughs> dylan's gonna explain it so from my rudimentary explanation or experience is uh basically the understanding that human life is invaluable and that the fact that we have this one chance at it uh that there's a sort of love and compassion that comes with it that allows any obstacle to uh be overridden or overcome as long as you can act within gratitude within love and within compassion all right Oh, it's from okay. Do you want do you want to take it? <laughs> oh, so was this um, question related to um, medicine Buddha practice? That was when you guys were here on Friday night. Or no, actually, Connor had medicine it. Buddha practice. Um, the the title can some be times be the wish for feeling jewel practice of medicine Buddha. Medicine Buddha practice. Yeah. I'm looking at Susan because you led it on Friday, right? Yeah. So. We've got Medicine Buddha right over here, which is the Tonka. Um, tonkas are just sort of the the nomadic way of traveling with paintings. So, um, but it, it's a specific practice that's looking at Medicine Buddha, which is a different deity from, you know, Tara or um, perhaps a, one of the historical figures that was at uh, uh, Vulture's Peak in, when we did the Heart Sutra. And so the, the practice is really, like Dylan was saying, trying to look at your compassion, but Medicine Buddha looks at specific things. So each practice that we do sometimes looks at different things, such as uh, Lama Sankapa and devotion to teachers and Samaya, or Medicine Buddha is a little bit more about freedom from uh, any sort of oppression. So not just sickness or, or being ill, but also from political oppression, from the oppression that we suffer when we hate someone, so being free of hatred. Um, so each of the deities that you see here and you know, hundreds more will each sort of focus on one aspect of a practice or one aspect of something that we wanna be free from to be able to attain enlightenment, to be able to strip away those, those fears, those angers, um, all of those things that keep us bound towards hatred and ignorance and allows us to move closer to compassion and peace, which would be nirvana. Great. Are you, do you guys have one more question? All right, you got it. All right, cool. All right, well, um, if there are no more questions at that point, I think we'll, uh, we'll close here. We have to, we're going to do dedications first, but then we're going to close. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll read it. Yes, yeah. sounds good. All right, we're up on the thing. All right. So, due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountain, you are the source of all happiness and good. 
All powerful Chen Raizi, Tian Xin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholder of the teachings remain forever, and may all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. No sign, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Rajapani, destroyer of the entire hosts of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the stony land sages, Osangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. All right, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I think we have yeah. some announcements. Some uh, so um is this on yeah okay so november 11th next saturday there is a the third meeting of the group of people and everybody is invited uh whether or not you've come to the other meetings or not um of we're calling it the delics these are the compassionates and caring people who are interested in helping others and learning how to do that in an effective and and skillful way so um on the 11th which is a saturday we're going to be meeting in the dojo the other big room uh, from noon to two and llama has promised pizza so <laughs> So there'll be food and um, if you come bring, you know, a salad or some fruit or something to share. But mostly this, the, the uh, program is going to be focused around what we call the paramitas, the far reaching attitudes, the measurables. And um, so on next Saturday, we're going to be talking about generosity and what your experience personally is with generosity as it relates to community as it relates to family as it relates to your job as it relates to yourself you know how do you express generosity how do you receive generosity what are your barriers to expressing generosity so that will be the topic of discussion and um so it's on saturday the 11th from noon to two thanks Hi, um, so right after our, uh, this, we're done here, uh, if you're interested, uh, we're having the first meeting of the Dharma Dudes, uh, the men's group. So um, yeah, I brought some food and um, hang out and it's no com there's no commitment to have to come every time. We're just gonna uh, get to know each other, um, have some Sangha time where we talk about what we're bringing to the Dharma from our lives and what we can do. I think it'd be really nice after this talk. I'm, I'm already inspired to think about some things to talk about. So yeah, come join us in the dojo. Omo araya pasayana ayindi Om araya pasayana Oh, more.